So let's start with you, revenue generation, right? How can AI help with current AI technology, yep. and what are the risks of that? Yeah, um, I think t to kind of baseline this conversation, last year when we released the Digital Hesitation book, in that there's a chapter around digital sales or digital-led sales. And we released uh, an enhanced version of our layer model, which everyone's familiar with, which is AP layer, or, or A player, which is analytics applied at the right place at the right time with the right person for the right conversation across layer. We largely wrote that with the context that smart people, data scientists and analysts sitting in teams of people, whether it's a centralized or in, in, in various functions, are enabling their respective functions to apply um, data and analytics to their sales process, right? But this was largely people connecting disparate data and trying to pull it together for a conversation. AI now takes it to another level, and we start to think about sales data and marketing data and service desk data and um, on and on, renewals data and so on, and we start to connect the ability for machines to literally create the sales place for us based on the various conditions. And so what we're starting to see emerge, and it's still quite a bit of a pioneer effort out there, we're starting to see abilities to kind of enhance propensity renew models, for example. What are the conditions under which contracts will be renewed? Happy, sad, mad customers. Uh, various other factors, and we can dynamically route uh, renewal opportunities into the best place for the best outcome, as, a, as an example. Or taking recommendation engines to the next level, where we're uh, providing customers the opportunity to purchase more other than what they currently have based on propensity um, to, to buy another adjacent product, as an example, right? And I think finally what we're starting to see is a hint of personalization conversations. We haven't really seen that flow through, but I think there's aspirations for technology to start to personalize message so that on a 180 day, 60 day, 30 day, mm -hmm. whatever, if I understand my persona and I understand what they're interested in, I can personalize the messaging to them that, that, that assist through the branding. I think that's kind of the, the, kind of the cutting edge of what's happening today. From the downside, I think there's a lot of hype. There's a lot of uncontrolled enthusiasm, and I worry a little bit about the democratization of AI, where you can imagine every, every sales person on an organization goes to chat GPT, says, hey, what's the best sales play to run for this customer at this time? Might be in line with what that company wants to achieve, but might not be, right? And so all of a sudden we have this proliferation of Mm -hmm. potential strategies that aren't under a unified governance, and I think we could see some okay. of this. Today we see kind of regionalization kind of with, with this challenge between standard, scalable, and, and consistent being challenged by potentially AI providing unlimited opportunities to differentiate. So, a couple yeah, of things. Yeah, I mean, I that, <clears throat> that is happening today. If you go on the LinkedIn sales channels, sales reps, are coming up building their own presentations mm -hmm. off of chat GPT and making claims about things that they're going to be able to do for the customer that have never been vetted by the corporation. Right, right? exactly. So it helped, you know, and we- And how we, is that different than it always was? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's easier. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's easier. You don't have to field engineer the offer. Now they have a tool that can field engineer the offer for you, right? But that is, a, that is a super big risk, right? Because it's very easy, and that's you know, one of the things we all know about chat GPT, it's very easy for it to sound right, whether it is or it's not, mm -hmm. right. right? And so it comes up with, can come up with very compelling storylines that we may not be able to actualize you know, in the delivery phase. Right. Yeah. So let's jump over to adoption, because this is a super yeah. interesting subject. Yeah. So I'm sure probably most of you in this room have a charter to drive product adoption. And in the last four years for education organizations, it has shifted. There was something else that was a primary objective, and now it's truly driving product adoption. Well, in order for that to happen, people have to consume content. You can't drive product adoption if you're not consuming content because it's that content that's going to give you the skills to interact with the product so that you are using it, driving product adoption, et cetera. So anybody in a content organization of any type knows that the bane of your existence is that content 
because in an X as a service environment, we know that product revs are, you know, like every other day, uh, un unlike the past where you probably had more of a six month cycle. So the curse for education organizations, you just have this abundance of content that you constantly have to produce and it's constantly changing because the product is in a continuous state of rev. So, there is a great solution, and this isn't pie in the sky. I have, I have members who are using it. So I want everybody to write this down. The name of the platform is called Learn Experts. And if you have an education organization at your company and those people are not here, you need to take this to them. And I'm just going to give you a really quick example. So uh, they did a demo with me, oh, I don't know, like 10 days ago. And in prep for the demo, what the person did that did the demo is they took a blog that I had written. So they didn't go through you know, all the content I had that was publicly available. They just took a blog. So loaded that up so that when I got to the demo, the blog was there. And I'm not kidding you when I say this. She said, OK, now we're going to create a course. Literally five minutes. I kid you not, it took five minutes. And so the way the blog was written, it was, you know, like most blogs, written in sections. So anybody in learning knows that you always start with a learning objective. So what the system had done is it had created a learning objective for each section based on the title of that section. Then there was the content that corresponded with that learning objective, and then at the end of each section was assessment questions, because we need to test your knowledge. Did you learn anything? And literally, all of that came up in five minutes. And so I quickly went through and looked because, like you said, you know, and it's not chat GBT. It uses generative AI, but it's not chat GBT, you know, subject to error. And I was amazed, amazed at the accuracy. And when you look at content development, so I'll just give you a number, the average amount of time so one hour of delivered content. So let's say I'm an instructor, I'm delivering one hour of content. It takes 40 hours to produce that one hour. So now when you have an eight hour day, that's what, I'm not good at math in my head, 320 hours or whatever, that is a lot of time and a lot of money. And what the member that shared with me this platform, that it drives down the production time 60%. Wow. So. And it's phenomenal. And is that text or images or? Uh, it's, it's all of it. So text, you just upload. So, the, so to create a course, what you would do is you just upload all your content. It can be existing content that your education organization has. It can be uh, information from a knowledge base. It can be your technical documentation. It can be release notes from product management, anything and everything. Just load it all up in there. And literally, five minutes, boom, here's the output. Um, Another one that I want to share is, uh, again, another member is doing this. So the other curse, like I always say to folks, you can put all the content in the world out there, but if people aren't consuming it, then you're not doing anything to drive product adoption. So you have to drive consumption. And so what another member is doing, and I love this concept, they use AI to identify what they call at-risk learners. So an at-risk learner is somebody who came into your system, your portal, your website, whatever it is, maybe three weeks ago, and you haven't seen them since. Or they've completed a course, but you really want them to do another course. So it identifies people that are at risk, meaning low consumers, and then there's automation behind that, so kind of like you were just saying. So automation behind that so that it can identify the at-risk learner and send some kind of automated message that says, hey, we haven't seen you in a while. Here's where you left off in your learning assignment, blah, blah, blah. Right. And, and that is awesomeness because, you know, if you have content and people aren't consuming it, you're, you know. So what, what, out of what's out there right now, what could go wrong? And so so there is another example. Um, and, and it actually wasn't what went wrong. It actually ended up pretty good. And it was somebody, when you asked about, is it text, is it? So I had another member who is using AI to uh, write scripts for videos. And then using the chatbot real persona to take the text and convert it to audio. And, and it wasn't that there was anything wrong with it, but the risk is th that person did use chat GPT. So now that content they produced is in the universe. And so the 
uh, attorney, their in-house counsel, you know, sent like a cease and desist letter. <laughs> Please stop doing this. We know this looks like great technology, but yep. we don't know what the risks are. We need to figure it out. And, and for a content organization, for education, that's your IP. So you don't want your IP to just be misused or misinterpreted or whatever. So you do need to safeguard it. And that's why I love this platform, Learn Experts, because it's not it's yours. It's within your. Yeah, because that's the other thing is this whole issue of currency of data. You know, yes. the, nobody, nobody is as current about your offers and your features and capabilities as you are, right? right? But, exactly. But you can go out. You can go out right now if you are, you know, if you're a Microsoft or a General Electric or whatever, and and you can just go to a, a general public, you know, AI tool like GPT. And it will come back with definitive sounding yes. stuff that's two years, two years old, right? So it's got to be your content, and then yep. your content has yep. to get protected, yep. otherwise it's their yep. content, right? Yeah, absolutely. It's everyone's yep. And that's the risk for sure, at least right now. All right, so let's jump over to service delivery, right? So now we've, we've got a customer, we've <laughs> got adoption, and we have to take these customers through a life cycle. How's AI helping us? Yeah, and you know, I think about this in the context of scaling the customer success or customer experience, let's say, overall. You know, listening to Thomas yesterday, he talked a lot about how companies are cutting back. They're certainly not investing in people anymore. So, but at the same time, there's this contradictory message of them being asked to scale their organizations and do more with less. So there have been you know, all sorts of motions in the past, things like knowledge base, driving people to self-serve, you know, teaching them um, train the trainer kind of stuff, right? You know, you teach one person the company, they teach everybody else. There are all kinds of ways you can scale human engagement, but AI is changing all of that. It's rapidly accelerating it, right? Think about it. Um, what Maria just discussed, you could have a beautiful knowledge base in a matter of hours. Yeah. And it's completely on the interaction that you've had over the years within your, say, support services organization or professional services or customer success, right? You could build that very quickly, and customers can still self-serve. They see no um, change, right? There's no apparent difference to them. So that's a great opportunity. Another thing, you know, localization. You know, yeah. things, uh, products themselves can very easily now be in a local language for people. Yeah. Everything's been in English for so many years. If you're lucky, the user documentation or training materials, again, Maybe you've got it in two or three languages. Now you can have it in any number of languages, right? Um, again, everything, it'll help with things like call deflection. There'll be less confusion. There's all kinds of great benefit there. The other thing from a pure customer success management perspective is, and we talked about this a little bit with sales, it's the sister to what Jack talked about, which is creating success plans and plays. Mm -hmm. Those go-to-market strategies on the post-sale side Plays can be dynamically updated as they happen. So if you come up with a new motion and deploy, for example, in professional services, a new method, you know, you modify your methodology and you have a new way to implement a particular feature, function, or tool, great, that can just go into the playbook and be immediately applied to right. every customer, right? So you no longer have to have, you know, this person teach this team and then this yeah. team over here, and then they all have to change the methodology documentation and redo the playbooks, now that's all done in, you know, in a flash. But of course, with that comes some downsides, right? We talked about them just a minute ago. JB, you brought it up. You have to be careful. This all has to be done behind the curtain, behind the firewall. It's your data. It's your information. It is your secret sauce. It's literally your proprietary information. So I've been working with a couple of members. They've been telling us how they're building this capability into their product. So for example, we have a member who does next best action creates next best action software. This is brilliant because um, now it used to be you'd take a whole bunch of data and feed it into the algorithm and then it would spit out an offer. Well now, that can all be done dynamically. You don't have to think about what are all the parameters and do I tweak this, tune that, pull this lever this way, this, no. It's all done dynamically. But with that comes the risk of you can't just get this stuff on the internet. You, you don't want your pricing exposed. You don't want your proprietary information, anything that's a patent, you know, right? And so you have to be really careful because, especially with services organizations, you're the ones out there on the front line deploying all this great technology and providing value for your customers and customers, right? So that's the biggest risk for sure. Yeah. 
Hey, John, one of the, you know, one of the things, again, Jim Roth said it yesterday, <clears throat> one of the, the issues is these data silos, right? So every organization has got, you know, its, right. its data. How is this, I mean, how big an opportunity is AI to solve the data silo problem? We could have solved that a long time ago. We've had incredible AI-based search technology. Mm -hmm. They're only implemented in a silo. So how many enterprise-wide implementations do you see? Very, very few. So I was just discussing that with Caveo yesterday. They're doing a lot of work on the commerce side. They're doing a lot of work on the support side. There's a whole world in between of content that's <laughs> not being indexed. It's not being leveraged. Customers can't access it. Employees can't access it. This is not new technology to solve that problem. It's a culture problem. It's not a technology problem. Mm -hmm. Interesting.